My paternal grandmother suffered from epilepsy. At one time, she was confined in a lunatic asylum at Bodmin in an ignorant attempt to cure her condition. On the release, she was so weakened from her experiences there that my grandfather, with no other means available, had to carry her on his back the mile and a half from Praise Railway Station to their home at Moorfield. Although having five children to feed, she was unable to cook as her seizures could leave her lying senseless on a hot Cornish range at any time. This meant that my grandfather, after putting in a full shift, working a rock drill and dynamite in the hard rock, and shifting tons of ore underground at Wheel Grenville Mine Troon, would then have to cycle seven miles home in all weathers to cook the family's evening meal. The cottage at Moorfield was one of a row of four. They were just two up and two down affairs with a privy at the end of their garden. Water from a tributary stream to the River Beeble flowing past the back door was used for ablutions, while drinking water had to be fetched from a chute 150 yards away down the lane. The cottages were so low that Mr Geoffrey, a very tall neighbour, was able to stand on a box and paint his bedroom windows. The first two council houses ever built in praise was in 1937, the coronation year, on the borders of Turnoweth Farm and facing the Camorn to Praise Road. Number one and number two coronation cottages. My grandparents and their siblings were allocated number one. There was pipe water with a sink in the kitchen, a flushing indoor toilet and a separate bathroom, albeit a bath with cold water only. There was no electricity, they still relied on candles and oil lamps for the light and a Cornish range for cooking and heating. And although there were fireplaces in both the sitting room and in the front bedroom, they were useless. By today's standards, it would be classed as squalid, but to them at that time, it must have been utopia. Granny had died before my mother and father married in 1942. But by the time I arrived in 1944, the house had electricity. The views from the back of the house are tremendous. Set on a rise, the two semi-detached cottages overlook Trenoweth Farm and beyond that the vista stretches all the way to St Ives Bay, where on a fine day you can see the passing ships sailing up the Bristol Channel or out into the Atlantic. Marrying the view were the electricity pylons that marched across the fields from the coal-fired Pale Power Station and then beyond to Falmouth on the south coast. They were, however, a blessing in disguise. A housing estate was planned, but due to the proximity of the power lines, this never happened. So we kept the views and still had cows for neighbours. One got in and trampled our garden once. Father took his compensation in the form of a pail of milk. With a herd of cattle just over the garden wall, there were always plenty of flies. And Father had a wonderful sense of humour and was always pulling people's legs. He would often tell how Gwyneth, my mother, got rid of flies out of the kitchen. She puts a bucket of dung in the front room. I have a patchwork of memories from my early childhood, taking my first steps in the kitchen. My sister was born when I was four and she caught whooping cough. She was not expected to live and I can still visualise the minister coming to baptise her with water from a pudding basin. Thankfully, she's still making a nuisance of herself even today. I recall sitting on the back steps, losing my temper with a chicken that was helping itself to bits of my pasty. I often saw Charlie Glasn, a distant relation, wheeling his bike up across the roadway field loaded with rabbits, caught down on copper bottoms, the piece of land left derelict after mining operations ceased there years ago. Copper bottoms was a paradise for us kids, Lots of clumps of gorse to hide behind or make camps, and the river beeble and various ponds to catch tadpoles and minnows in. A disused mine shaft surrounded by barbed wire stood on a little hillock, and if you threw a stone in the hole, you could hear it echoing its way down until there was a faint splash at the bottom. This was a favourite spot as it was an ideal place to run a dandy down over. My friend Ivor and I were on the top of this mound one day and saw the sun to the owner of the neighbouring farm set him fire to gorse bushes. We shouted at him to stop and he ran off crying his eyes out. Within five minutes his father suddenly appeared wielding a large stick and he chased us the length of the moors. But he didn't catch us. Looking back now it was an idyllic time for me. No worries about exams, girls didn't feature very much and with war rationing becoming a thing of the past, plenty of food. 
Mother was an excellent cook and fellow pupils were always bothering me to see if I had any of her spice cake. I went with father when he helped the local farmers with their harvest, following binders to retrieve the sheaths and then shocking them into five for the corn to dry. Later, returning to load the dried sheaths onto horse-drawn wagons to serve as a thrashing machine, and I chased mice and rats across the fields with our dog Jack. I recall rising at five in the morning to accompany my father to pick mushrooms, or more sensible times of the day to gather blackberries. But my young days of childhood were running out. Sadly, Bapa Dali, my grandfather, passed away. He died from silicosis, a miner's disease. I remember him sitting in his carver chair by his bed, unable to lie down, gasping for breath. Father started his own business as a greengrocer. He cycled to and from Camborne every day, where he rented a small field to keep Polly our horse and a shed to keep the wagon in stock. I always went with him on Saturdays and most days of my school holidays. The council came and tore out the Cornish range and replaced it with an agar, at the same time provided hot water to the kitchen sink. And yes, we had hot water in the bathroom. By this time, Polly had been put out to pasture and Father had bought a Bedford CAF van XAF 186 and with the council's permission had built a garage and stores behind the house. I passed the 11 plus and was congratulated with a brand new rally bike to travel to the railway station to catch the train to Halston Grammar School. I have calculated that I must have travelled a minimum of 15,000 miles over the next five years. But that's another story.